All right, everybody. Well, hello and welcome everyone to A Sailor's Life Live. Uh, this is our educational program series from the USS Constitution Museum in Boston. And my name is Sarah. I'm an educator at the museum and I'm excited to have you all uh, joining us here today for our program this afternoon. And we're also joined today as our co-host of one of the active duty Navy sailors on board USS Constitution. So I want to turn things over to Jay on the ship so that he can introduce himself to you all. Hi there folks, my name is Seaman Jay. I'm an active duty Navy sailor aboard this here mighty vessel, the USS Constitution. USS Constitution has been around for 222 years. She's participated in the Quasi War, the Barbary War, the War of 1812, and she also participated in uh, anti-slave trade pre-Civil War. And then after that, she begins her role as more of a ceremonial ship. Uh, however, throughout American history, she has always proven a, uh, to the United States that she is a useful asset uh, in the United States Navy. That's great. Well, thanks, Jay, for joining us. Thanks for that great introduction to the ship itself. Um, I'm excited to see what you have to show us over there on the ship today. So we'll check in with you uh, in just a little bit once we get going in our program here. So everybody, we've got an exciting topic for our program this afternoon. Over the past couple of months, Emily and I have been talking about different aspects of the lives of sailors who lived and worked on board USS Constitution. Today though, I wanna talk a little bit about the home and the office of those sailors, which is USS Constitution itself. So we're gonna be talking about the design and construction of USS Constitution. Now, let me pull up my screen here to get started. This, of course, is our ship, Old Ironsides, as she's affectionately nicknamed. We'll unpack that nickname a little bit through our program today. And to talk about the ship's design and construction, we're going to go a little further back in time than we've gone in our programs before. So before the War of 1812, which is the war that USS Constitution is most famous for participating in, we're going to go all the way back to the 1790s, because at this point in time, the United States is a brand new country. And we had just won the Revolutionary War, won our independence from the British Empire. And at this point, our, our government, the, the people who live in the country, early Americans, are trying to figure out how this is all going to work. And one of the big economic factors at this point in our country's history is trade. Now, trade is still a huge part of our economy and our lifestyles today, but in the 1790s, it was vital. So just like if, if you're at school and you're trading one of your favorite snacks or a snack um, with a, a classmate who has another snack that you want, on a much larger scale, Americans are trading goods that we had a lot of with countries on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean who have goods that we need. So some of these things that we had, you can find on the top arrow of this graphic on the screen. These are common trading goods and the route across the Atlantic Ocean in the 1790s. So you can see how it's a nice exchange of goods between the Americans on one side of the Atlantic and the countries on the other side. There was a bit of a problem with this though, because there were other countries who may, might not necessarily have been involved in the trading of goods who would intercept these merchant ships, either stealing the goods or stealing the, the crew and the ships themselves. And so our American, early American vessels who were involved in this trade, they needed protection. They were very vulnerable at this time. So enter our first president, George Washington, who's the leader of our country at this point. Washington and the Congress in the 1790s they have to come up with a solution to this problem. How are they going to protect American trade interests? They decide the best solution is to form a Navy. And they decide to form the US Navy with six warships of the frigate class. 
Now, a frigate is just a, a type of ship. So that's the type of ship that USS Constitution is. In the same way that there are different types of vehicles, like an SUV or a van, they're both still cars or vehicles, a frigate is just a type of ship at this time. They decided that was the best option for the Navy. And the US Navy is founded here in 1794, officially with the Naval Armament Act, where they decide that they are going to build or purchase uh, six ships to start the Navy. And so that answers our question then here of why USS Constitution was built in the first place. Why do we have this ship and even why we have a Navy as well? So our next question then has to be, how are we going to build these six warships of the frigate class? How do you build a ship? Well, you can kind of boil down the components of a ship into four main items. So that's what I wanna to do to, to start us off here. I wanna think about four key parts of a ship that you're gonna find on any ship in the late 1700s or early 1800s. So in the same way, that your school bus that you take to school or the car that you drive around with your family or friends, both of those types of cars have um, wheels, they have an axle, they have an engine and a steering wheel. We can find similar parts that go across all ships at this time as well. So the names of those key parts of a ship are the keel, the hull, the masts and the sails. So these are the four parts of a ship that I want to focus on here today. And we're going to play a little game to identify these parts of a ship together. So the way that it's going to work, I'll read to you all a, a little description of one of these parts of a ship. And you can share with me in the chat which part of a ship you think that is. So I want to start out here with one that you may have heard of before and that is the ship's sail. So a sail is the cloth pieces of different shapes that catch wind and help move a ship. Now, using the chat, you guys can tell me which of these numbers you think the sail is. You can see they're either pointing to or they're on top of different parts of the ship here. So you can use the chat. Let me see what you guys are thinking so far. Okay, we've got a couple numbers here rolling in. Give you another minute too before I reveal. Got some good guesses so far. All right, I'm going to go ahead and reveal our answer then is two. So you guys got it right. I saw a lot of number twos in the chat and there's actually two number twos on our ship image here, isn't there? So that's because Constitution has a lot of sails, right? We can see that in this model of the ship. There's all kinds of different sizes, different shapes of sail as well. And there's nearly an acre of sailcloth on Constitution when all of the sails are on the ship. And these serve important role for the ship itself because like our description says, these pieces of cloth, they catch the wind. So together with all of these lines here or pieces of rope, this makes up the rigging of the ship, which when you move it in certain directions will help the ship move in a direction as well. So this all makes up the engine of a ship like Constitution. And it's a pretty important part then of the ship itself. So we have our sail. Well done there, everybody. Our next key part of the ship is the keel. Now the keel is the base of a ship that stretches from the bow, which is the front of the ship, to the stern, the back. So which of those numbers do you think is the keel? Let me pull up the chat here. See what you guys are thinking. Okay, so far so good. We've got a couple guesses in there. This one might be one you haven't heard of before. I'm gonna go ahead and share the answer. You got it right in the chat. So the keel is number four. Now that is all the way down at the bottom of our ship, the base, as it's described in that little definition. And we like to think of the keel as the backbone of the ship. So if you take your hands and you feel your spine on your back, your spine is really what's helping you keep a good posture, helps you sit up straight, helps you stand straight. 
but you also have your ribs that are coming out from your spine and your rib cage helping to protect your internal organs. And in a lot of ways, the keel serves a similar purpose on a ship like Constitution. So that keel is serving as a backbone at the very bottom of the ship and out of that keel, we have the supports, kind of like the ribs, that are helping keep the hull together and the ship sturdy and supportive. So that keel, the backbone of the ship, another important part of a ship like Constitution. Okay, next we have the hull. Now the hull is the body of a ship. So which of these numbers do you think is the hull? guys are doing really well at this. Some good guesses. Only two numbers left. Yep, okay, so I'll go ahead and reveal. This hull is number three. You've got it. So the, the hull is the body of our ship. It makes up the sides of the ship that come up from the keel, the base. And on Constitution, even though we're looking at a model, which is certainly outside of the water. When you look at Constitution today, we see a lot of the hull, the sides of the ship, that's above water. But it's important to remember, there's a lot of that hull that's also below water as well. So that body of the ship um, is a key part of its design, which we'll touch on in a little bit. Okay, our final um, part of the ship that I wanna talk about here, just might have given it away there, uh, is our mast. So a large pole that rises above the ship's deck and supports the sail. So again, there is only one number left. If you were paying attention, you should be able to guess um, which one this is. Check the chat here. Yep, you guys got it. So the mast is number one on this image. It is only indicating one mast here, we can see rising above the deck. But Constitution, as we can see from this image, has one, two, three masts um, on this particular ship. So we see them towering over the top deck of the ship there. But what we can't see is that they also continue on into the, the lower decks of the ship. So not only do they support the sails, the rigging, that engine of the ship, um, but they're also a, a structural component of the ship as well. So you guys did really well at that. We might have some uh, experienced sailors watching in with us today, but it's one thing to look at these parts of the ship on an image, but it's a whole nother thing to be able to see them on the ship itself. So since we've got Jay over there on Constitution, Jay, can you show us some of those pieces of the ship that we just talked about? Where can we see them um, around you on the spar deck now? Absolutely, so you can see quite a few things up here from the spar deck. If you look around the ship, you'll see these big, white, um, long poles sticking up from the deck. Those are known as our maps, which leads me to my next point, which is the actual yards that hold the sails. Another key component in actually driving the ship. And if we come over here uh, by the brow, you'll be able to see uh, the top sides of our hole that's actually protruding from underneath the water. But it is key to keep in mind that there is actually about uh, a lot more of the hole that's hidden underneath the water line. So there's our hole, and of course you can't really see the keel uh, just because that part of the ship is underneath the water. That's right. We probably need some x-ray vision or to go for a little swim to be able to see the keel, huh? So are there, Jay, can you tell us, are there any sails on the ship right now? Yeah, we do not have any sails on board uh, just due to COVID and whatnot. We haven't had everything rigged up. Uh, definitely not see where they at the moment, but we do have sails in our uh, storage facility. That's right. So typically in this time of the year, the ship would be rigged up with the, the sails on the um, yards, as you pointed out to us there. But we have a couple of photos. Um, that photo we saw in the very beginning of Constitution, you could see what it looked like with those sails unfurled out uh, in the harbor. So 
I have just one thing to supplement the keel, because as you mentioned, we can't see it um, from where you are now, but it's important to remember that the, the keel, as we talked about, it's like the backbone, right? But on constitution, it's important for that structural, all the structural integrity that it brings to the ship. It's also important because the keel has some of the oldest original pieces of the ship. Isn't that right, Jay? It is correct. The keel actually holds about 10 to 12 percent of the original wood that was constructed and utilized in 1797 when this ship was launched. That's right. So our ship, like you said, launched in 1797. That makes it, as you told us in the beginning, almost 223 years old. So it's been through a lot. You shared a little bit of that with us in the beginning too. So pretty incredible that the ship is still there. It does mean that a lot of what we see when we look at Constitution today has been replaced and restored over the years. Um, but we do have pieces of the keel that are original. So I have a photo of that I can show you all now. And this is an image of part of that original piece of the keel. A museum staff member was actually able to touch this piece of history. You can see from the, the photograph um, during a recent restoration, which was a couple years ago. And so Constitution's keel, definitely important for all the reasons a keel is important on any ship, how it, it keeps everything structurally sound as that backbone. But this one also has a lot of history as well, which is pretty special too. Okay, everyone, so we've now talked about some of the key components that make up a ship. So we know that there are these pieces involved in the construction of Constitution. And the men who were designing and building Constitution and the first frigates in the Navy in the 1790s, they had all of these in their minds as well. They could look to examples of other ships from the day, from navies like the British Navy or the French Navy, and they could see these other examples and how they put these different parts of a ship together to make the most successful ship that they could. That was pretty high on the minds of, of a lot of these people at the time that they were designing and building Constitution. There's an interesting quote from the time that I think really speaks to this. It's from a report that the Secretary of War wrote uh, in 1794. So the same year that the Navy is found, founded and the same year that building begins, the keel is laid in 1794. He says the vessel should combine such qualities of strength, durability, swiftness of sailing, and force as to render them equal, if not superior, to any frigates belonging to any of the European powers. So in other words, the United States, we're looking for ships that can outrun and outgun the competition at the time. And that is the job of this man we see over here on the left side of the screen. So this is an actor portraying a real person named Joshua Humphreys. Humphreys was the designer, the architect, we can think of him, uh, of USS Constitution. So Humphreys, he gets to work um, designing this frigate, the first ships in the Navy. And he makes plans, he makes ships models, much like you would draw blueprints or plans if you're building a house or a building, he does the same for Constitution. And he spends a lot of time focusing on the ship's hull, the body of this ship, because the hull, the shape of the hull, is really important to help it outrun the competition. The shape that he designed for Constitution allows it to move quickly through the water. But it's also important, the materials that he decided to use to build this hull of the ship. Now, we know Constitution has the nickname of Old Ironsides, but there is no iron in the sides of this ship. There is, however, a lot of this here. So Constitution has a frame, a hull, that's made out of live oak. And this is a picture of a live oak tree. Now live oak is really dense, really hard and heavy, sturdy wood. And so this is what's used to build the frames of the hull. The sides of the ship are made with this live oak combination of this and white oak, another really sturdy wood. And together that creates a really strong base and body of the ship here. And I think this image is really interesting, right? You can see, look at these branches. They're all like gnarly and all over the place. 
Um, if there are any Harry Potter fans watching, this really reminds me of the Whomping Willow. Um, but you could use a lot of those branches as well for certain parts of the ship uh, that you needed to build. There were timber merchants who created guides like this one you can see on the screen here that shows you can use different parts of the tree, even some of those curvy branches for key support structures on the ship. So those shapes were important as well. Now, this live oak specifically, this was native to Southern United States. So you can find this tree in the really hot, humid areas of South Carolina and Georgia primarily. And so New England men were sent down to that area of the country to help harvest this wood. But it ended up that many of these men became sick from diseases after being in this area of the country that they weren't used to and doing this work that was very difficult and backbending work. So much of it ends up um, being harvested by the enslaved people who were on plantations where many of these live oak trees grew. So it's because of their work that we have these live oak trees harvested. They're transported from the southern United States up to these northeastern shipyards where then the timbers is cut and assembled into our first frigates like USS Constitution. So that's where we get our strong sturdy hull that make up the sides of old iron sides. Now, Jay, I want to check in with you again here because Constitution in the War of 1812, one of her battles, she actually these strong sides play a pretty key role um, in one of these. Can you tell us the, the story of that? Absolutely. The story of how old iron sides got her, her famous nickname is a classic. So the story goes, our captain, Isaac Hull, was headed up the coast of Halifax. Halifax is north of us, and Halifax is also a very prominent and significant uh, Royal Navy uh, port during this time period. And as Isaac Hull is uh, headed up this coast, uh, we spot a ship out in the distance. And out in the distance, we spot this ship hoist up the Royal Navy flag. So from there we set. The men were sent to their stations and everyone was getting ready for battle. I mean, men were sent to lock, men were sent to their guns, the Marines were sent to the fighting tops, uh, officers back to the helm. They are getting ready for battle. And as we get closer and closer, we identify this ship as the HMS Guerrier. Now the HMS Guerrier was actually a ship that conducted a chase against us with four other ships. So it's five ships total chasing us, the USS Constitution, out of the A Harbor in uh, New Jersey. So that was uh, kind of a stain on Isaac Hole's reputation. So as we're heading closer and closer to the ship, uh, things become a lot more personal to Isaac Hole, as not only is his duty as an American naval officer to take down this ship, but also he has a little bit of a bridge going for him. So as we're getting closer and closer, the British begin firing at us. Bam, 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 bam. They're firing at us, and our crew looks to our captain, Isaac Hole, and we ask him, sir, may we fire back? And Isaac Hole says, hold fast and stand fast. Do not fire until I give the command to fire. So, keep getting closer and closer to the ship. Now they're firing at us, and this time their shots or their cannonballs are actually hitting our sides. So you don't know when the next shot you hear is gonna be your last. Now it's getting tense. Everyone is just standing by. And so we look to Isaac Cole one more time. Sir, may we fire now, sir? Isaac Cole says, hold fast and stand fast. Do not fire until I give the command to fire. So now everyone's really sweating. They're thinking Isaac Cole, our captain, has lost it. He, he is driving them into madness and a one-way ticket to kingdom come. So we get closer and closer. Now they're firing at us and the shots are literally zooming over our heads. Very very tense moment. We look to Isaac Cole. 
once again, he tells us to hold fast and stand fast and do not fire. So, you know, due to all the training we've had, uh, we decide to actually stand fast and listen to his orders. Because Captain Isaac will actually know what he's doing. He saw the British who were actually wasting their ammunition. Uh, they were really, they were hitting us, but they weren't hitting us in tactical spots that was going to actually weaken us. So, what the British were really doing was wasting their ammunition. And it wasn't until we were about 25 yards away from the HMS gear rear. We're so close, our gun teams can see the rot of the British sailors' teeth through the gun force. From there, Isaac Cole says, four inter boys. Finally, the USS Constitution, that's a big old can of uh, something, uh, whip out and across these decks, bam, 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 bam. We are finally firing on the US or the HMS Guerrier. And as we're fighting, one of our sailors notices something very peculiar. He notices that the British shots aren't actually penetrating our hull. So he's very, very confused. He runs topside and he leans over the ship. And just then he sees a British cannonball fly across the waters. Suddenly bounce off the side of our hull. And in his excitement, his adrenaline-induced uh, state, he turns back to the crew and he says, Huzzah, her sides are made of iron. And thus, the nickname of old iron size was created. Well, we weren't finished with the battle just yet. We continue to fire our shots, and we actually had a young Marine lieutenant who decided that he wanted to try and board another ship. Unfortunately, this Marine Lieutenant, William S. Bush, died in the process and effectively became the first Marine Corps officer to die at sea. And then uh, following that, we continue firing on the HMS Guerriere and we managed to tear down her foremast, her mainmast, and her mizzenmast, which is all of her mass. Therefore, the HMS Guerriere uh, becomes the HMS Canoe, and she can no longer fight. We have prevailed victorious. The USS Constitution has won her first major battle, a major battle that will lead to about 32 other battles, which we will also. That's the story of HMS here. here. Man, you had us now, on the edge of our seats there, Jay. So now we know how Old Ironsides gets that nickname, right? There's not necessarily iron in those sides, but that hull was so strong you said, the, the sailor says, huzzah, her sides are made of iron because those cannonballs are just bouncing off. So that uh, ship design ended up helping, I would say, argue for part of that battle, um, helped the ship be victorious. Certainly the, the crew played a big role in that as well. But you just explained to us a little bit of two stories there, how Constitution not only outguns in the Battle of Guerriere, but outruns competition as well with the great chase. So those are two great examples from the ship's history of how the, the design ended up being pretty, pretty effective, I'd say. So while we're on the gun deck, Jay, can you do us a favor and show us the gun port? Can we see just how thick the sides of the hull are at this point on the ship? Absolutely. So if you look at this gun port right here, it's a little difficult to see, so I'm going to try and unfasten this. But our ship is constructed of, or our hull more of, is constructed of, of two types of woods. You have live oak, which is here in the middle, which is an exclusive wood that is grown um, in Georgia, which the United States had specific access to, whereas the rest of the world did not during that time period. Now, the thing about live oak, it is five times more dense than traditional white oak that is normally used on board ships. So when you combine that with two slabs of white oak in between a piece of live oak, kind of like an Oreo cookie, you have a very, very dense hull 
has qualities of that of iron or metal. So you're not getting through this with a British uh, gun. Yeah, we know they did it in Gary, the Battle of Gary, that's for sure, huh? So great, thank you for, for showing us that. And I like that uh, imagery of the Oreo cookie. That's kind of a yeah. to think about the, the different types of wood there in the hull. So great, thanks, Jay. So we have one other kind of unique feature of the ship that, um, Jay, you actually helped us out earlier by taking a video of this for us. So this is a structural component of Constitution. I'm going to play the video for everyone quickly, um, and then Jay will have you share what it is that we saw um, in that video you shot. So let me pull that up. You can see this other unique design feature, aside from the strength of the hull. All right, there we have it. So a short clip, but Jay, can you tell us where in the ship you took that video and what it is we were looking at there? Absolutely, so this ship is truly a testament to human and American innovation. What you saw were diagonal riders. Now these diagonal riders are very significant to the construction of this ship. Our uh, ship's creator, Joshua Humphrey, was actually a farmer and a Quaker before he became a shipwright. And due to his experiences as a farmer slash uh, Quaker, he used to live on a farm and construct, so he was sort of, sort of a, a carpenter. And this was the design that the Quakers utilized for their barns, actually. So if you flip the ship upside down, you'll see that it resembles a uh, Quaker barn quite uh, very quite closely um, so in addition to that these riders also provide a lot of support for all these guns and structures that are above the waterline uh, these or these diagonal structures weren't really used anywhere else in the world the, uh, the Americans were the first ones to utilize them and we still have them on board today, obviously, and they still actually do help us by preventing our keel from hogging, as we call it. So this is the keel right here. This is the keel hogging. But the diagonal riders, thankfully, bring the keel up so it is well, like that, as straight as it can be. Great. Yeah, that's a great explanation, right? So the diagonal riders, I'm just going to show an image to show us where on the ship, like you said, if we were to flip it upside down, it'd be like the roof of our, our ship, right? So that means these are down in the very bottom of the ship. You can see on the screen here, these dark gray lines. And just like Jay said, these are really helpful to kind of distribute all of the weight of all of these cannons, all of the 500 crew and all of the cargo on the ship to keep that keel, keep our backbone nice and straight. So another, um, unique design feature to Constitution here. So we've talked then a little bit about some of these structural design features of Constitution. I want to quickly share with you guys one of the more decorative elements of Constitution's design because there are some decorative features of USS Constitution and on most ships at this point in history, the 1700s and 1800s, you're going to find a pretty iconic piece of decoration, and that is the ship's figurehead. Now, the figurehead is located on a ship at the front of the bow, so the very front point of the ship um, underneath the bow sprint. And I'll show you here, you can have figureheads of all different shapes and sizes. This is a, an image of a display in a museum in England where they've collected figureheads from different ships from this period. And you can see, you can have real people, you can have men or women, you can have animals or historical figures, religious figures, um, mythological figures, anything you can think of, you could decide to put on the figurehead of your ship. So when our designers and our builders were thinking about the figurehead for Constitution, they had an important decision to make here because this is a symbol on the ship. When you're sailing at sea and another vessel sees this figurehead, it can certainly identify the ship, 
but it also tells something about what the ship stands for and represents the ship in some way. So this figurehead is an important decision. It was certainly on the minds of people who were designing it. One of the carvers asks, or says, as the constitution of the empire is the result of the union of the states and the union begets strength, it ought to be represented by a Herculean figure uh, with a hand presenting a scroll of paper supposed to be the constitution of America. So these men are looking for a figurehead that shows the strength of the ship and of its namesake constitution. So what better figure then than Hercules? They decide to make Hercules the first figurehead of constitution. Now this figurehead unfortunately doesn't make its way to the, the War of 1812. It doesn't last that long on the ship. So we have very few images of what the, the figurehead of Hercules looked like. But we do have this 1803 painting by an artist named Michel Cornet. And we can see if you look really closely here, right at the bow, underneath the bowsprit, we have our Hercules figurehead. Now I tried to zoom in as much as I could before it got blurry so we can look a little more closely, but here we see our Hercules on USS Constitution. So it's this white figure stands out against the dark wood of the ship and the strong figure taking a step forward and a scroll in his hand, which represents the US Constitution, again, the namesake of our ship. So that was the the first figurehead of USS Constitution. Um, there's been a lot of other decorations up on the bow of the ship since that point. And Jay should be over. Uh, we're gonna check in with him on the pier. He's, gonna, he's running off the ship for us to show us what we can see on the bow of Constitution today. All right, Jay, what do we see on the bow now? We have this design. Uh, which was implemented during the 1920s during our uh, most major restoration. And this vine is uh, encompassing some sort of like bindy, kind of like uh, used to call Roman design. A lot of vines going to the very top of our building that do a nice little spiral with the stars uh, right in the center there. And then all this vine down, 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 down. We'll see uh, in there again soon. All right, yeah, so we got some nice patriotic symbols on the ship, yep. I see the stars and stripes, and like you said, it's now a billet head um, on the ship there, so a little more of the scroll work that we can see. So um, that's pretty neat. Thank you for showing us that. And I think, you guys, we've covered a lot of ground on then the design of Constitution, right? We know these main parts that make up a ship like Constitution. We know some of the unique features of this ship's design particularly, and one of the decorative elements. So all that's left to talk about is how they, where they built the ship and how they built it. And Jay, you're actually really close to where Constitution was originally built, right? Can you show us that area? Yeah, absolutely. So if you look right over here where that pier is, right across from the water, or right across from us in the water, you'll see that there's this pier. And that pier today is uh, present day Coast Guard Base Boston. However, that is also where we were launched in 1797, just right there out of the harbor. That's right. So Constitution is, is looking out at where she was first built and launched all those years ago. Um, I have an image here to show everybody watching just how busy that shipyard would have been. All of these men working to construct constitution, like Jay said, um, just across the water there. So this is an Edmund Hart's shipyard, would have looked something like this. All of the sawing of the wood and building these scaffolding, bringing the heavy, heavy timber up to build our ship's hull. Because the first step in building a ship like constitution is of course laying the keel, as we've talked about, that backbone of the ship. And from there, you build up the hull and the sides. And once you've got that completed, it's about time to launch your ship. Now, unfortunately for Constitution, it took a couple tries to be able to launch our ship. Uh, after three years of building, George Claghorn and the, the builders, they were ready in September of, of 1797 to let the, sh the ship's hull gently glide into the harbor uh, so that they could 
put on the mast the sails, get the rigging up and the ship seaworthy. And it was a big deal for the Navy, for Boston, all kinds of townspeople came to watch this historic moment of Constitution's launch. They christened the ship, smash a bottle of Madeira on the bow is tradition. And even the president of the United States is there at the time, John Adams. He's from Massachusetts. This is a proud moment for him as well. Everyone's gathered around watching for the moment of the launch and it doesn't happen on September of 1797. So unfortunately, Claghorn, other builders, they had calculated exactly the angle that they needed the ship to be at to be able to launch into the water. And they built it at that angle. But what they didn't account for was remember how heavy all of these building materials are? Well, as they're building the ship, slowly that changes the angle of the ship over the three years. And so it takes them two more tries until they can adjust it just perfectly so that Constitution is officially launched in October of 1797. And uh, we have a video of this, animating this on our website. So and Emily, my colleague's gonna share that in the chat if you guys wanna watch the story of this all unfolding um, on YouTube. So of course, Constitution is launched on October 21st, 1797, and she ends up in Boston Harbor again, 223 years later. So a lot happened to the ship in all of those years. A lot also happened um, in the Navy with ship design in the past 200 years. So Jay, I wanna check in quickly with you before we wrap up to hear what ship design is like in the modern U.S. Navy? Because I would expect we're probably not going to see too many other wooden frigates, right? Yeah, absolutely. So this is the only ship in your current day United States Navy that is made of wood and has sails. But uh, throughout the years, uh, U.S. Navy ships have really developed um, in their own certain respective rights. Uh, during the Civil War, I like to think of that period of time for the Navy, kind of like the uh, awkward teenage years of the Navy, because you had these ships that were kind of, they didn't understand, they didn't want to know, or they, they couldn't decide if they wanted to be submarines or ships, and so they were called ironclads, uh, made of iron actually this time, the very weird shaped uh, ships, of course, and then you get to the Second World Wars, where ships really uh, start to develop their, uh, their modern design. If you look over here, the ship, uh, the USS Cassidy Young. This ship is actually from the Second World War and the Korean War. However, during that time period, that's when you see American naval design really take its, uh, really uh, decide on how it's going to look and how it's going to be designed. We actually have ships that are currently in service, destroyers, cruisers, that look very, very similar to this now. That's right. And there's on a huge scale too, right? I'm, I'm going to show quickly some of, um, I think, the extremes of modern ship design. So we have, of course, USS Constitution, our OG. But then we have this here, an, a massive aircraft carrier. Something like this has airplane runways and it holds thousands and thousands of people. It's like a city floating on the water, right? And so we have everything like from this down to the smallest commission vessels in the U.S. Navy, um, one of which happens to actually be a neighbor of USS Constitution and the Navy Yard. And Jay, you said this little boat has a, a fun nickname um, in the, the Navy, right? What do you guys call that? I love to call her the mighty USS Beaver, because that's what she is. She's about the size of a beaver. And we use her to actually tug out old iron sights when we get underway. So oh, there we go. You guys can see all kinds of naval ship design then if you come and visit the Charlestown Navy Yard. Everything from old iron sights herself to, as you showed us, Jay, uh, USS Cass and Young, World War II Fletcher class destroyer, to that little 19 foot mighty mighty beaver uh, as well. So we are running a little over here. So I want to wrap things up. Um, thank you guys all for, for watching. We hope you learned something new today about the design construction of our ship, USS Constitution, um, and a little bit about the other ships in the, the modern Navy as well.
So Jay, do you have any final words before our group here, before we, we sign off for the afternoon? Uh, no, just make sure to come in the Boston area. And, uh, we're open from Friday at 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. every day until Sunday. So just Friday through Sunday, 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. That's great. So go see the ship. Also come visit us at the museum. We're neighbors in the Navy Yard. Emily shared a link in the chat where you can find information about our hours from Thursdays to Sundays, uh, where you can buy tickets uh, in advance to come and visit. So um, thank you guys again for watching. We have a short survey. If you have a chance to give us your feedback at the end of the program, we'd really appreciate it. Um, and we'll be back in a couple weeks with another episode of our our program here. So in the meantime, take care everybody and we will see you next time. Bye.